Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth installment of our exciting new online lecture series, Hunter at Home. As our hundreds of regular viewers know, these programs feature Hunter's top faculty responding to the pandemic with crucial life and death information. And they also offer the kind of diverting enlightenment we all need to stay intellectually stimulated in seclusion. Be sure to stay tuned for next week's Hunter at Home, when animal behaviorist Diana Reese takes us deep into the mind of the dolphin and shows us how she communicates with one of the most enchanting mammals on earth. These programs help our community continue to learn and grow and keep us connected to each other during this difficult time. They are a way for us to continue to live the Hunter motto, Nihi Kura Fatori, the care of the future is mine. Before we start today's installment, I must thank those of you who have donated to help our students get through this crisis financially. Our Coronavirus Emergency Assistance Fund helps students pay for basic needs like rent and food. Hunter's Summer 2020 Scholarship Fund will enable students to continue their schooling this summer. So many of our students have lost their internships, their summer jobs, and all sources of income. But with your support, they will not lose the progress they can make towards the finish line of their diploma. So thank you. Today's Hundred Home focuses on our most vital resource, food. How to get it when so many shelves are so often empty, and how to make sure that what we do get is both safe and healthy both virus-free and nutritious. How do we deal with paper bags? How do we deal with boxes, containers, and plastic bags of produce? We need to raise these questions, and fortunately, we have the perfect experts to provide the answers. One of our speakers come from the trailblazing Hunter College Food Policy Center, which we launched in 2012 with the goal of developing innovative solutions to address food insecurity and diet related diseases. Our hope was to move the needle on key food system issues in New York City and beyond. We have done this and more. The center has truly made a difference. So thank you to Lori Tisch and the Illumination Fund for helping us launch this important resource and to speaker Corey Johnson and the New York City Council for their long term investment in the Hunter Food Policy Center's important work. I think it's fair to say that in the current health crisis, we need the center more than ever. So today we welcome our Food Policy Center Director, Professor Charles Platkin, who is here this morning with Dr. Urvashi Rangan and Donald Schaffner to discuss everything you need to know about grocery shopping, food science, and eating healthy during COVID-19. This discussion could not be more timely. As well as serving as director of our center, Dr. Platkin is professor in Hunter's nutrition program and the author of numerous best-selling books on diet, nutrition, and addiction. He is also the founder of dietdetective.com, a website that features more than 700 articles and interviews on nutrition, food, and fitness. Dr. Platkin, thank you for being with us today. Dr. Arvashi Rangan is the co-chair of Funders for Regenerative Agriculture and is the chief science advisor at Grace Communications Foundation. She was formerly an executive director at the Consumer Reports Food Safety and Sustainability Center, where she acted as a fearless food watchdog, protecting consumers from harmful food pockets. We welcome Arvashi and thank you for coming. We also have with us today, Dr. Donald Schaffner, who is an extension specialist in food science and a distinguished professor at Rutgers University. Dr. Schaffner's interests include hand washing and cross contamination. He has authored more than 180 peer reviewed publications and educated thousands of food industry professionals around the world. He is a fellow of the Institute of Food Technologists, the American Academy of Microbiologists, and International Association for Food Protection. In his spare time, Dr. Schaffner co-hosts the Food Safety Talk and Risky or Not podcast. We look forward to hearing from Charles, Urvashi, and Donald as all of you tackle this vitally important topic. And to our audience, thank you for participating today 
and for zooming in to hear our speakers. Thank you for being part of Hunter at Home and our Hunter family. Stay safe and healthy and come back and connect with us at our next Hunter at Home program. Charles, Arvashi, and Donald, thank you. Thank you, President Rabb, for the kind words and good morning, everyone. I wanna thank you so much for coming to our Food Policy for Breakfast seminar series. I wanna welcome you to Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center's second webinar and our first Hunter at Home program. My name is Charles Plackin. I'm the executive director of the center and also a nutrition professor here at Hunter College. There are so many fears, concerns, and questions around food safety these days, and I'm thrilled to have two world-renowned experts to help sort through the clouds and the mysteries surrounding today's topic. Again, we have with us today Dr. Rashi Rangon, the chief science advisor at Grace Communication Foundation, and Dr. Donald Schaffner, an extension specialist in food science and distinguished professor at Rutgers University. I would like to welcome and thank you both uh, for appearing today. Thanks a lot, Charles. Good to be Pleasure here. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. And um, I think we should get right into the questions. I think uh, hearing our bios and everything is wonderful, but people want to know what to do. And I think one of the biggest questions uh, for me and for our audience, we've been getting emails, and I think you could still uh, email us at info at nycfoodpolicy.org if you don't see your question covered. Um, and I guess one of the biggest questions is, you know, can COVID-19 live on food? Because both the FDA and the CDC have statements regarding COVID-19 uh, being transmitted through food. And their statements are, the FDA said that it wants to reassure consumers that there is currently, and this is the word that frightens me, no evidence of human or animal food, or food packaging being associated with the transmission of the virus. And then according to the CDC, they say coronaviruses are generally thought to spread from person to person through respiratory droplets. Um, uh, and this word again bothers me currently, there is no evidence uh, to support transmission of COVID-19 associated with food. The phrase is generally thought, quote unquote, and currently give me cause for concern. Um, it sounds like the CDC and the FDA are not sure just like, well, not the FDA or CDC, but just like the mask advice, the staying at home advice, the packages and the plastic carrying, the virus advice. So I'm concerned about the mismatched messages. And, you know, um, how can we be sure that these messages are accurate? We're, we're, you're scientists um, and you know how research goes. We're still correcting things from in nutrition from years ago and food safety from years ago and on and on. And it's a circle. So tell me. Tell us. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll go first and then I will let will Arvashi say something. So I think you, 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 raise, you raise some very, very good points. And so let's, let's sort of bump out to the, to the top level, right? We know for sure the virus is spread by person to person contact from symptomatic individuals. That, that's a, we know, we just absolutely know that, right? We also have evidence that the virus is spread from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals. And again, we have some, some actual cases that we can document are transmitted in that way. Um, and then we also have through some computer models, we have estimates of what, the, what we think the asymptomatic or the pre-symptomatic transmission rate would be. What we don't have is we don't have a smoking gun that says, okay, this guy was working in a deli and he sneezed on a bunch of sandwiches. And then, uh, you know, 10 days later, people who ate those sandwiches, they developed COVID-19, right? We don't have that. And the nature of epidemiology is probably such that we, we, we will never have that, or at least we, the, the signal, for the signal to be big enough, we'd have to have a lot of cases being spread in that way. Now, one thing we've, we've, we've heard about, you know, in discussions about reopening the economy, we've heard about testing and contact tracing. I think with, with more aggressive contact tracing, we might see if there, we might be able to, well, well well, and here's the other thing, we'll never be able to, con you can never prove a negative, right? So there's never going to be enough data to say, we know that it can't be transmitted by food. All we can say, and this is what CDC and FDA are saying, is at this point, there is no evidence that has been transmitted by food yet. And that's why it's phrased in that way. And it's phrased in a way such that if we d were to learn that, then, you know, we could, we could correct that statement. So, so that's, that's kind of my, my, my opening thoughts on the subject. I, I don't know, Charles, I don't know if that, if that makes it more clear for you. And then I'm sure uh, Urvashi has some comments as well. 
Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, I'll just jump in really fast. Um, and this is with my sort of toxicology hat on. I have found that my last 30 years of training in different disciplines is all sort of coming together here in COVID, <laughs> which um, I suppose is nice in a way, but um, I just maybe want to back up and share with people what I learned in toxicology in grad school, which is about exposure routes. And under, if you understand how you can be exposed to something, you can understand how to control that, right? And at the end of the day, I'll just say it comes down to your hands. Um, so, you know, Don is right. We don't really know the answers to all these things. The, the, the only thing we can do is to be extra vigilant about how we handle things. Um, contamination in food is spread through handling in general. Um, there's usually a source of, of the problem, which tends to be a gut level pathogen, whether it's E. coli, um, I'll argue maybe COVID is part of our industrialized system. We can talk about that later, but um, norovirus that's often on a lot of meat, for example, or campylobacter, all these things are um, the way we would deal with keeping clean and maintaining hygiene in all those situations also applies here and extra so. Um, so in exposure, we know we can breathe it in and we know with this virus that droplets um, can be breathed in. We also know um, another study just out in Nature today that it's really probably aerosolized. That's why I think we see these really big group uh, transmissions that happen either in synagogues or uh, nursing homes where we have a lot of congregation going on. Um, these droplets can probably hang out in the air for a while. And that's why it's really important to be wearing a mask and also know that surgical masks do not protect you from that. And so, you know, I know this is not about masks per se, but it is the uh, better filtration masks that you can even get to even with a sewing mask. And we can talk about that in a little bit, but um, you can get something that has a pretty good filtration rate that will help you with both bigger and smaller droplets. The other route is uh, potentially through skin. Skin is an organ. We don't think COVID is absorbing through skin and being transmitted, but that said, I want to explain that that is, you know, things can uh, go through our skin. The other thing is eyes, um, and that's why we see so many of our uh, healthcare workers with eye protection, because if a droplet goes into your eye, that would be another way to make that happen. Um, and also if it's on your hand and you rub your eyes or you pick your nose or you pick your teeth or you bite your nails, all those things are ways to transmit any kind of disease. So uh, then the other one under the oral and the mouth is called, it's not appetizing at 1040, but it's fecal oral transmission, which means um, that fecal matter can be contaminated. If your hands get contaminated with fecal matter, Maybe you don't wash your hands after the bathroom. And then you put that in your mouth, that, that bacteria can transfer in. So um, we do know COVID can survive in feces. There are studies to suggest that, and even through some wastewater treatment. So we want to be careful about that. Um, but also, this just all goes back to washing hands. And I'll say when you're at the grocery store or whatever else, and you come home, have a section of your house that's like a decontamination section where you take off your clothes, you take off your shoes, you take off your gloves, so that none of that stuff is then going into your kitchen. Um, and you wanna try and minimize whatever you might be bringing into the home that way. So um, I'll stop there, but I just wanted to explain a little bit about thinking about transmission and exposures to things in general and how you can protect yourself. So I'm, I'm going to jump in there because I have a lot of questions based on what you said. And um, just so the audience knows, I, I have a relationship with both Urbashi and Don. As a journalist, they both have been my sources for quite a long time. So don't think I'm being too harsh on them. Um, <laughs> so you, We're all friends. We're all friends. <laughs> so you mentioned feces, okay? And, you know, that's one of the things that um, I believe that, you know, hand washing, you know, was part of that, you know, at restaurants and at food service establishments. That was one of the things that we were supposed to be doing to prevent, forget COVID-19, that was for other food, you know, born disease. 
And so the fact that COVID-19 can, can, can be uh, possibly transferred through, through fecal matter um, concerns me. I mean, I, you, I don't know if you're aware, but I also did an airline water study where I found fecal, you know, uh, fecal matter in, in, in water um, and on airlines. Um, and uh, so, and, and, it, and it's common. So here, now you have food service workers, right? Um, there's takeout, there's, uh, you know, with del uh, there's delivery, uh, there's food handlers. We're already concerned as public health advocates about feces being, you know, on, on hands on, and so forth. If someone prepares food, um, and I, go, I know these are long shots, but again, we're trying to minimize risk, right? I mean, that's what our objectives are, not to panic people, and not that this, is gonna, this webinar is gonna be splashed on the front page of the post. Um, but uh, again, my concern about using, you know, someone not washing their hands carefully enough, or um, uh, putting on, you know, gloves the wrong way, um, as a food service worker and um, us, you know, uh, eating that food, what can, we, you already said that it's possible. So now, unless you wanna modify that statement, like, you know, when you touch the, someone touches the food, they have feces on their hands by chance, uh, and then we, we ingest it, okay? Which, which I know that probably freaks everybody out, but it, but it happens in regular restaurant and, and uh, you know, food service take, you know, food service workers and so forth all, all the time, doesn't it? So Charles, one thing I think that might help Urvashi and I is if you direct a question at one of us versus the other, but I, I have a few things that I want to say. And so let me, let me jump, jump in and say, you know, uh, experts, reasonable experts uh, can agree to disagree. So I would say that what, what Urvashi was recommending in terms of when you come back from the grocery store, uh, quarantining your groceries and stripping down and, and, and changing out of your clothes, that I think is, is an extreme risk reduction measure. And again, I'm not here to tell people what to do, but I, I'm here to say that that's it's not something that I advocate. It's not something that I'm doing. I can tell you what I am doing is I've told my my 80 plus year old grandparents, or my parents rather, um, my, my kids' grandparents, my, my 80 year old parents, that they're not allowed to go to the grocery store, right? Like I, I think that that is the, the big risk of them. And again, it's not from uh, the food packaging causing them to come, become sick, but it's being around people that are sick and they're and they're at a higher risk because of their age. So. I'm recommending that another family member who lives close to them do their grocery shopping and then that they that they socially distance from from that family member when when the groceries are delivered. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about fecal contamination. We know uh, we, we've we've seen studies that sh that show that SARS-CoV-2, which is the causative agent for uh, corona for COVID-19, um, is found in feces. We also know that with the SARS-1 coronavirus, there was at least one documented outbreak uh, that happened in an apartment building and what was happening was people had the, the the virus in their their fecal matter they flushed it down the toilet but because of some um, incorrect plumbing in that department it was actually generating aerosols and people were inhaling um, the, the virus through that bad plumbing system so that's not really a fecal oral transmission that's that's fecal inhalation which was which is kind of weird and, and unique to that that SARS-CoV-2 um, I think the other thing that we have to be clear of, uh, for a virus to infect a person, there needs to be a receptor, okay? And if you've, if you've seen pictures of the coronavirus, it has that corona, of those, of those spike proteins. It's actually the ends of those spike proteins that, that bind to a receptor on some human cells called an ACE2 receptor. And, that, and it's necessary but not sufficient for that spike protein to bind to that ACE2 receptor. And then there have to be other uh, biochemical mechanisms in place for the cell to, in, to, to take in that virus, okay? And we, we know for sure uh, that we have ACE2 receptors in the lungs. Um, what we don't know, and there's one preprint out there that's not peer-reviewed yet that shows that we have ACE, ACE2 receptors in the esophagus, and in, the, in the stomach, and then in the, or not in the stomach, but in the, the, the small and the large intestine. So it's possible, but again, no evidence that the virus is being transmitted in that way. And, and for sure, Charles, I'm freaked out about people with feces on their hands handling my food, but I was freaked out about that before COVID-19. I'll be freaked out about that afterwards. And so the bottom line is that people who, who uh, handle food should wash their hands. But even more importantly, people who are symptomatic with diarrheal foodborne illness, like, like norovirus that Urbashi mentioned before, people with norovirus shouldn't be handling food. I don't care how good your hand washing is. If you have diarrhea, I don't, I don't want you touching my food, right? Bottom, bottom line. And same thing with, with COVID-19. If you're sick with uh, symptoms or flu-like symptoms, like from COVID-19, uh, the best thing to do is 
for you to not be around other people. And no matter what your job is, right? Whether you work in a food processing plant, whether you work in a grocery store, whether you work in an office building, if you have those symptoms, you shouldn't be around people because you're at risk from, from the coughing and sneezing and, and, and exhaling the virus. So, and thank you. Arvashi, do you want to say something? Yeah, I do. Thanks. Because um, I want to clarify, Don, I, I wasn't suggesting that people take off all their clothes after they shop every day. Um, but I do think there are some basic good, good hygiene practices that people should take. And um, one thing I've seen, I see even my own family put masks on the kitchen counter. No. Masks should be going into a separate place in the entranceway of your house and really don't take those masks anywhere else. Second thing is masks, um, to the degree they're fabric, need to be washed. Um, and if COVID's going to be on that mask, if you were exposed, it's going to be on the outside of that mask. So if you touch that mask and move it, you might want to wash your hands after that because that is a way of transmission. Um, similarly, gloves. So hopefully you're out there shopping with gloves on, and that's to protect you. But also when you come home, you should take those gloves off and wash your hands anyway. It's it's just a good practice. And um, shoes, taking shoes off at the front of your house is just a good practice anyway for not tracking in lots of different things. There is some talk about COVID being very sticky. I don't know if that's true or not. But again, these are about taking precautions um, in a reasonable way that can help you. Do you need to change all your clothes and shower every time you go to um, the store? No. But I will tell you that I had a health scare and thought I might have had appendicitis and sat in the emergency room locally for five hours. Did I come home and change my clothes and take a shower? I sure did. Um, so, you know, it's really about where are you? Uh, where, what is the sort of risk of transmission? On fecal oral, let's just be very clear. There's a certain amount of filth allowed in the world. We don't live in a sterile world. Um, and Fecal contamination sounds gross, but there is a certain base amount of it, and we do it through E. coli counts or enterococcus counts in water, for example, and it has to be below a certain limit in order for it to be acceptable. So um, that exists throughout, and I think we shouldn't, we don't need to overly think that. Again, it comes back to people who are preparing food should be protected as well. They should be washing their hands and maintaining what we call sterile technique, but that's to avoid cross-contamination. And there is a science behind that. And to the degree we can maintain that for ourselves, that's what we should be doing too. So thank you for that. So um, my, my question is, and I, and I really wanna, if it's possible to have a brief answer, and I'd like both of you to answer it, Don first, then Arashi. Do you think that the virus could live on the surface of certain foods? Whether or not it's transmitted, that's, that's, that's all I wanna, from a food scientist uh, perspective. Sure, so, so let's, let's, let's fir the first, the first uh, point I'm gonna make is that word live. Um, there would be some virologists who would suggest that these viruses are not alive. Like they are not, they don't share characteristics of other living organisms. So a virus is actually technically never alive, whether it's on food or on plastic or on, on the sidewalk. Um, it, to rephrase, to, to, to sustain itself. Not yeah, right. And so, and so what, what, I've, what I've tried to do is, and then again, we all make this mistake, right? I've, I've tried to condition myself to say survive, right? And so um, we know, and again, we saw reports that um, from some um, um, personal communication in one of the CDC reports that they found viral RNA 17 days later. So I think the most definitive study on this is one that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what they did was they looked at, at SARS-CoV-2 as well as SARS-1, and they studied the survival on different surfaces. And the, the good thing about that particular study was they actually used um, tissue culture to quantify the infectivity of the virus. So it wasn't just a matter of seeing RNA, it was actually infectious virus. And so I think that's a very, very important um, uh, distinction there. And another thing to, to say in this study is they, they talked about how long it survived. Well, the, but, but I think more importantly than how long it survives is something that in, in the New England Journal of Medicine article, they called the half-life of the virus, right? And they said that the half-life of the virus on plastic, which was the kind of the worst case scenario, was about seven or eight hours. And so what does that mean? What that means is if you have a thousand virus particles at um, time zero, 
After eight hours, you have 500 virus particles. And then after another eight hours, you have 250. And then you have 125 and on down and down. And so what that means is that for each um, eight hour time period, the, the, essentially the risk drops by 50%. And so the, the, you have this 50% drop in risk over time. And so um, now what we don't know is how those same survival kinetics would play out over food, right? And so but we, could, we could say for the sake of discussion, like let's say worst case, it's probably the same as on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the, the plastic. What, the other factor is temperature. And so we know that the virus survives better at lower temperatures. And so if a, if a virus is placed in the refrigerator, it's going to last a lot longer than if it's at, on the counter. And if it's placed into, let's say, a, a boiling pot of stew, it's not going to last very long at all. And then conversely, if you put it into the freezer, it's going to last a really, really long time. And then the other factor that comes into play is humidity. And, and generally speaking, the, I be, and I believe, I believe it's that the, the higher, the, the lower the humidity, the lower the survival. And so the virus likes high humidity environments. It doesn't like low humidity environments. And so that may, that may come into play as well, uh, depending on the humidity of the, uh, or the, the relative humidity or the, or the water activity of the food product, which, which would correlate to, to relative humidity. So, so th there are some things to think about when thinking about survival on food or food contact surfaces. Arashi? Uh, well, I'll just reiterate a couple things. I agree with Don on all those points. Um, you know, it's a question of viability, right? And measuring RNA is not a measure of viability. It's a measure that it was there, but it doesn't mean it's, it was, it's that we know it's alive. So it's like finding DNA on something it doesn't mean that there's an alive thing there right then and there. It's just an imprint. Um, and so it is about infectious dose and, you know, infectious dose is a funny thing because it's probably a range. Number one, people have different ranges of susceptibility. Um, and so that also factors in. So there's length of survival and there's also what, you know, the base amount was there. Now we can't see any of these things. So it's a little silly to be like, hmm, on that one, I bet there's less than that one, because you, you can't really know that. Again, it comes back to good hygiene practices. I will say that when I shop on the weekends and I go to my farmer's market in New York City, I do think about, and this is my anecdotal statement, that there's a few people that handle the lettuce I'm going to buy at that farmer's market. And I guess it's not that there's no risk, but I think about how many more people might have engaged with a piece of lettuce I've bought at the grocery store. And it makes me feel better to buy it at the farmer's market. Is that scientifically proven? No. But I will just say that handling is something as a food scientist, I have often, you can correlate handling to levels of food safety problems, to levels of bacteria. So I just, that's just something to think about in the back of your mind is um, how, how much has that been handled? Because that increases risk. It doesn't mean it's there, but that is what risk is correlated to often in food safety. You know, to that point, Rashi, um one of my questions was about, about handling and like, are there certain foods that, you know, are, are not hand picked and, you know, produce wise. And, and I don't know if you know this off the top of your head or, or Don that are not hand picked that, you know, and again, I, I know as scientists, it's hard for you to process, to, 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 to listen to these questions and then think like, Oh, you're not going to get it. It's enough already, but you know, I'm still not buying it. I'm just telling you, as, as you know, and you I, can eat cooked foods, Charles, like if you're that risk averse, and I guess it depends on your own level, then you cook all your food, right? And that's not just for COVID, that's for anything. Um, so yeah. if you want to maintain that, you know, I, I personally don't practice that, but if you want, if one wants to maintain that, they can, and then you should cook all, all your food. That deals with most of the pathogens. And to what degree and is it, it, are foods different? A certain, should it be different degrees for different foods? Or is it, you know, um, is it above 200 degrees? Is there a certain, and for how so long? It's temperature for the organism. It's not really about the food. Um, and it's probably like in ground meat, it's making sure you penetrate that temperature to the center of the meat. Um, and that the whole food reaches that temperature for a certain amount of time. 
So Norman, right, and and for and for ground for ground beef, I mean, again, I'm really not worried about getting COVID-19 from my ground beef. I'm much more worried about E. coli or salmonella. And and again, the other thing to realize too, it's all about risk, and it's all about risk risk trade off, right? For me, it's not about absolute safety. And so, yes, you could switch to an all cooked foods diet. Um, that's probably you could reduce your consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, that's great if you're worried about getting COVID-19 from fresh fruits and vegetables. I'm not, but if you are, do that. But there, there's consequences to your health to reducing your consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's really, it's all about risk, risk trade-off. And remember too, even cooking your, 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 your ground beef to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, well, that's going to reduce the level of salmonella and E. coli by a, a very significant amount. But there, but if you, un, and again, if you, if you think about exponential decay of the virus on, on surfaces, uh, the, the same thing happens with killing pathogens in, you know, foodborne pathogens during cooking. You never get to zero risk. All you get is a lower and lower probability of risk. And so, you know, and at some point, if you cook that hamburger too much, you're going to form um, nitrosamines or, 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 you know, carcinogenic compounds on the outside of that ground beef, which is going to increase your risk of, of colon cancer or stomach cancer, right? And so it's never, we, we, we have to always be navigating like this world of, of risk, risk and risk, risk trade-off um, and trying to make the best decision for us at, at the time. And again, so my recommendations for grocery shopping for, for me or for, for my wife are going to be different than my recommendations for my elderly parents, right? Because it's all about risk risk trade-off and what you're willing to tolerate and what you can accommodate in your life um, uh, and, and so try to you know make an informed decision based on the best available data so speaking of that of risk reduction um, and by the way that information about the freezing and the refrigerator it, it, it's I know it's always been intuitive to you Don but uh, for me I always you know and we've always we've had this discussion I think 15 years ago uh, about freezing bread and things like that and and um, so it's good to know uh, uh, about that. Um, so about washing, okay, washing fruit and vegetables. Um, so is there a certain temperature should we should wash them at? Um, should we be washing them? Um, with what solution? Uh, we've heard a lot that uh, the coronavirus is not sustained. Do you like that, Don? I'm, uh, I'm getting it right here. Um, is not sustained if you uh, wash it with soapy water for, for 20, you know, your hands for soap, with soapy water for 20 seconds. What about if we, if we do believe that it can live on the surface of food, you know, fruits and vegetables, because they are being handled, what is it that, that the solution? Should we have a little soap in there? Obviously, um, not obviously, but we also want to talk about uh, mild bleach solutions and Lysol and people spraying their packages and the dangers there. Um, because people are afraid, they're scared, and, and, and I don't sit there and I'm not criticizing them for their fears. And, I, and just um, one other point, people are emailing info at nycfoodpolicy.org. I'm looking at your questions. I'm incorporating them into these discussions um, as, we, as we speak. So just so you know, you can email, and I'm, I have a screen up here with emails, so you can email. Yeah, so so a cu couple of different reactions. Um, soap is really good for washing your hands. I absolutely do not recommend it for produce. Uh, there was a, a viral video from a pediatrician um, who was advocating disinfecting your groceries and washing your produce with with soap, and uh, that kind of got me aggravated and irritated. And I posted a, a nice long tweet thread about that, um, which I think a lot of people found found helpful. So um, my recommendations as far as washing fr fresh produce, uh, my recommendations is wash it with water. Um, you don't need to use soap. Um, you you should not be you you absolutely should not be using disinfectant wipes for cleaning uh, produce. If you read the label on those disinfectant wipes, they say um, uh, use of this product inconsistent with the label is violated violation of federal law and they should be used on hard surfaces. So please don't Lysol um, your apples as I, I saw somebody uh, reporting that they did on Twitter. That's a really bad idea. Um, I don't recommend watching, watching with a, a bleach solution either. Um, uh, and again, one of the things that I saw that was really kind of very interesting um, was a recent report from CDC published in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports showing that calls to poison control centers for uh, people getting sick from consumption of uh, cleaner, cleaners or disinfectants was up 
uh, almost 100% over, over last year. And so obviously people are very concerned about the virus. They're, they're taking extraordinary measures, but they're also putting themselves at risk um, of potentially being uh, hospitalized. I saw one of the uh, case reports that was detailed in that MMWR article was a woman who uh, decided to wash her produce in her sink with chlorine and vinegar. Uh, and, and that was a bad combination that ended up creating chlorine gas. And she ended up going to the hospital um, she didn't get hospitalized, but she ended, going, ended up going to the emergency department um, because of that, which again, uh, as, as we've heard discussed, that's probably a, a really bad place to be right now because there's probably a lot of people with COVID-19 there. And so um, it, I think it's really important that people take appropriate measures, but, but to, not, to not go overboard with cleaning and disinfection. Again, you know, disinfect hard surfaces, uh, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, wash your fresh uh, produce with, uh, with, with, with uh, cold water. If it's something with a hard surface like a melon or an avocado, you can scrub it with a scrub brush, but I'm, I'm still not recommending soap or bleach. Or, and, and again, if you, if you have some of the, this, um, this, this uh, uh, produce wash, something that's marketed as for use on produce, you can use that if it makes you feel better. A lot of those products haven't actually been evaluated for effectiveness, and so you may just sort of be wasting your money. But again, if it comes down to making you feel better, do it. But, but definitely no to, uh, to bleach and, and definitely no to uh, any sort of harsh cleaners for, for, or soap for fresh produce. Thank you. And I, so just because we only do have an hour, and I honestly, I could sit here with, with both of you probably all day. Um, can we, I just want to shift to food safety regulations for meat and poultry. Um, and Arvashi, I know you've been looking at this. You, you were a consumer reports as a chief scientist there looking at this for a very long time. Um, so we've seen bits in the news about increased uh, speed of production lines and poultry. Um, and there's been, uh, you know, kind of discussion about uh, food safety regulations being um, reduced. So should we be worried about food safety uh, decrease regulations, um, not even for COVID-19, but for standard foodborne disease um, at, at these facilities? And also, you know, at, at with, you know, with produce too, and, I, and I'll, and I have more questions to this, um, would you like me to ask them all together and, or, or, or take it one at a time? Well, maybe I could just reflect on that a little bit, um, Charles, and then you could dig in. But yeah. I will just say that this time really highlights a lot of the fragility and vulnerabilities of our globalized food system. And I'm very, I, I spent a lot of my time thinking about that very thing and how we've already been on the brink of a lot of safety problems in food for a long time. And meat, pl meat packing plants are among one of the worst occupational hazards out there to begin with. They're not well protected worker classes already. They already have one of the highest rates of injury. Um, and when it comes to contamination, I can't really think of a worst condition of sending an animal down the line and having the same person hit that with their knife and the next person right next to them hits the next bit and the next person down there hits the next bit. And so if there's any contamination along that, it will just spread very quickly along the line. And Charles, I don't have a, the figures off the top of my head. It's hundreds of chickens are processed in one minute at a plant. If it gives you some sense of like, how how are these things even being processed? Um, processing is very consolidated. There's only about four companies that own about 80 or 90 percent of all the processing plants. Um, and for food safety advocates, we've been looking at that as a slow train wreck for a long time. And this is only highlighting um, the real cracks that have already been in this system for a long time. And I'll just say I'm really concerned about the safety of those workers in those plants. Um, they are underrepresented. They are often already on the margins poverty wise. They don't make a lot of money and they're not well protected. And I think it's actually horrific that they're being sent back to work as an order. Um, we're already seeing t about a 10% infection rate in meat packing plants, which is totally terrible. So, um, there are a lot of opportunities to, I think, improve our food safety regulations, but I think in the bigger picture, I look to what are 
better production systems that don't put pressures on our system for organisms to become more virulent, more resistant over time. And to me, that is pesticides, that is herbicides, that are, that, that are chemicals, disinfectants, things we load our system with in our industrialized food system um, that we can document um, exacerbate some of these problems. So we can actually make more virulent E. coli by dabbling antibiotics in there constantly, and we've seen that in the studies over time. Um, things like regenerative agriculture that do not use and do not rely on these pressures um, will remove those pressures from organisms to self-select to become more virulent and more resistant to these things over time. And that's where I think the sunlight is. That's where I think um, the real sort of solutions that we all need to be looking to over time are and that we should be focused on because there are real solutions. We don't need to hide in the dark over this and there's a real opportunity to redefine what resilient food looks like and that is based on local economies, resilience, supporting local farmers, um, and those food chains that are in that niche right now, Walden Meats is a great example in the Northeast, um, are, are actually growing right now. And there are, people are finally sort of realizing the importance of that local food around them and being able to support that and getting food to them even faster, which is just a better thing. So rethinking centralized food and centralized distribution, because those aren't things that in the end are the most resilient or I think where our focus really needs to be. Thank you for, for that. And, and we, we share that we, we agree and share with, with most of those that are all of sorts. Um, I, I guess, you know, two things about this. So there are relaxed um, uh, regul uh, have they been instituted, have they instituted relaxed regulations at this point um, at, at meat plants or that's just a rumor going around? No, okay. I don't think there's any. I mean, first of all, the standards at meat plants are that, the, you know, a certain amount of the meat can't contain beyond a certain amount of salmonella. They're already not very adequate, and we can't take anything that comes out of as a meat plant as being not contaminated. You have to treat meat as if it's contaminated, no matter what, really. So th those standards haven't been relaxed, but they were never good enough to begin with. Um, and it still sort of gets to, you know, if you're handling meat, you need to follow good food safety handling practices. And the same thing applies now. And, and what about- yeah, Char Charles, can I, can I make a comment? So I think, I think uh, Urvashi and I agree on a lot of points there. I think there's some points maybe where we disagree. I think right now it, we shouldn't focus on the points where we disagree. So I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that and say that I think that there's a couple of things that I found very interesting about, about the pandemic. And that is, that is, it is, it is, it is accelerating trends that we already saw in terms of working from home or, um, delivery services, uh, and so, you know, and those are, you know, maybe positive or negative, but, but there's certainly accelerating trends that we already saw in our culture. But I think also, and this is where I want to uh, strongly agree with Urvashi, it's also exposing cracks in the resiliency of our system, right? And so we can argue about the nature of food safety regulations, we can argue about the nature of, of capitalism, but, but I think that ultimately we should realize we should all of us in the food industry and 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 food safety experts etc academics we should all take this as an opportunity to realize that we have the potential to design or to to take this this lessons that we're learning now and build a food safety system that is more resilient right so we're learning that if you shut down restaurants um, that same food that was destined for restaurants, well, it can't easily get to the grocery stores because it was packaged and it was, it was in a different supply chain. And so th thinking, thinking strategically about how we can redesign our supply chain so that we do have resilience, right? So we, we see that meat plants are shutting down because of COVID-19 infections, right? Well, the demand for meat hasn't changed at the supermarket level. Farmers are still raising those animals, but now there's no slaughter plant in the middle to connect those animals that are being raised to people that need that meat. And that's a, that's a, that's a fundamental problem in the system, right? So we've, we've spent all this time and resources raising these animals, but now we have no capacity to, uh, to slaughter them. So how do we build a, a food supply chain that is more resilient, that, that gets to some of these issues? And I don't think we have any answers, but, but for sure this, this pandemic has pointed out those, those, uh, those cracks in the system. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I want to dig a little deeper, Ravashi, because I'm, I, I'm just trying to keep conscious of time. So, it, again, these are questions that I, I, we've received and, and so forth. Um, and so inspections are still taking place. We saw an article today in Politico actually saying that the inspectors are not being protected, you know, correctly. Um, but I wonder, um, you know, is that, could agribusiness easily take advantage of this time period of crisis and um, not even do those minimum inspections? And then the other question about food labels, Ravashi, um, which I know you're a world renowned expert on, um, are, can we still trust all the food labels that we trusted before, like organic? Um, I'm sure there's a reduction of inspections. I'm sure that um, big agribusiness might, uh, because it's a crisis, oftentimes people kind of, you know, uh, relax their own rules around things. Um, and I know these are all possibilities, but I'm wondering what your instinct and feelings are um, about this. You know, Charles, I guess I have a more optimistic kind of outlook, which is that I think if you're a label program, you're doing the best you can to maintain inspection right now, given the crisis and that we're supposed to maintain social distancing. So will certain things get compromised in light of these public health protections? Maybe. Do I think there's a major slide going on in food safety inspections? I, I don't, and I don't have any evidence of that. But what I will say is that um, inspections for organic only went on once a year anyway. And so I don't know that there would be a huge change to that, at least right at the moment. Um, and I would not say that any good farmer out there getting certified is all of a sudden saying, yippee, I don't need to meet standards. So I, I really don't want, I, I guess I want to say like, we have some really good progressive farmers out there who are doing an amazing job, who are producing food without drugs, without chemicals, without, if they're using nature-based solutions, they're actually increasing soil fertility. And some of those are actually, because they were never in the main distribution chain, are actually thriving. And, and so when you wanna talk about what resilience could look like, it's really exciting to think that we could support local economies producing food in a much better, healthier way for all of us and for the planet. And so for that, I think food labels are a great way to um, still continue to shop for better produced things. I think your farmer's markets are a great way to support your local farmer um, and local food economies. And, um, and then there are CSAs, which are really interesting too, community-sponsored agriculture systems, which I think, I hope get a whole lift this summer because what an amazing way to invest in um, a deeper, more resilient food system and get your food really right to you and more direct so there's less people touching it, again, all across the line. So um, I think that there's a lot of hope actually and um, we're seeing that out there and I think we should be thinking about how we can support those systems better. And I just wanna go back to you know, fresh produce, fresh food. It's really important that we're eating that and this is not a time to distill us down to canned foods. That's not the answer and processed food isn't the answer. You could come up not very difficult with a rationale of why canned food is the way to move forward. Um, I don't believe that. And um, I don't want COVID to scare us away from thinking that either. I think we need to be rational about this. We need to maintain some rational practices and at the same time, start to think about what does a better, healthier food system look like and how can I support that even right now? Okay, I just, so I'm, I'm yeah. getting a Charles, can I can I just quickly quickly chime in and say again? I think I'm I'm really heartened that Irvashi and I agree on like ninety percent of what of, of what she, I agree with ninety percent of what she's saying. All I would add is that uh, I would say canned foods are not the solution, but they are probably part of the solution. And in these times, um, as we are wanting to go to the grocery store less, you know, certainly keep up your consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. But realize that if you you know you maybe you want to buy a few cans of soup or cans of beans or tomato sauce, and because that's going to let you get back to the go back 
back to the grocery store at a shorter, at a, at a longer uh, frequency. And so I would say, you know, in the, in the, in the short term, um, uh, canned foods are part of the solution. Um, but, but ultimately, we all want to get to the, the place where we have a, a healthy food supply, we support local agriculture, all of those things are, you know, big thumbs up in, in my book. So, so getting back as you know, pe people want these practical things, right? So we know that, you know, freezing and, and refrigeration can potentially increase the um, uh, uh, survivability. No, <laughs> is, that, is that the correct term? Um, yeah, survivability. And um, we, we know that you think that cooking, if you want it to be completely risk averse, is a, is a great idea, but you don't have any recommendations specifically on boiled, baked, grilled, none of that necessarily matters, just as long as it's cooked to the correct temperature for that food. Um, you don't suggest using a soap and water solution um, for, uh, for cleaning vegetables and, and, and fruit, but you do recommend uh, using water to, to wash them and then washing your hands afterwards. I'm just trying to summarize this. Um, Don, I know that you and I have had a discussion about pizza. Is that correct? Or um, that you're, that I was really shocked. Uh, pizza has a, a very high, is resilient to most foodborne disease. Is that, is that accurate? Well, it, not, not, not exactly. I mean, we know that, so what we do know is that pizza is one of those hot foods that's commonly found out of temperature control. And based on research that we've done studying pizza at Rutgers University dining halls, what we find is that even though it's not being held at the proper temperature, we seldom find um, marker organisms, indicator organisms that indicate a, a problem. Doesn't mean that pizza can't make you sick. It just, it's just a little bit surprising uh, that, it, that it doesn't have more bacteria. And it's probably because it's a, it's a fully, for the most part, a fully cooked product. It's got a low pH because of the tomato sauce. It's got low water activity because of the, the cheese and the bread and the baking process. Um, but yeah, so this is an opportunity. And, and you know, we need to patronize our local restaurants. Uh, we've got a local pizza joint here in the town where I live. Uh, they switched to takeout only. And so we're trying to, you know, get pizza from them as often as, as uh, well, not as often as we can, uh, but, but as often maybe as, as we were doing before the pandemic. What about things like, uh, you know, we, we have a little bit of time remaining. I do want to get to some questions and kind of feel rushed here. But, but um, again, and I, I know you covered this, but I just want to be clear. A worker or a food worker sneezes, coughs, sweats on, you know, uh, on meat, and then it's served to you once restaurants reopen. Sushi, um, you know, sweats, coughs, sneezes, and then it's served to you. You know, your, your comment, let me just correct it, you know, get it correctly, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, we don't have any evidence necessarily that it, there are receptors in our esophagus or, or so forth, or, you know, where our mouth, you said yes, but um, that that's not the normal way it's being transmitted, but it could potentially be transmitted that way. Should we, when we're, when we're transitioning to restaurants, should we really, in this semi-normal time, should we really think twice or will you think twice before when you sit down in the restaurant or you're, you know, and it's served immediately, um, not, it's not being reheated, it's, or it's, it's something that's like sushi, should you think twice if potentially there was an infected worker at this restaurant and, you know, and you're eating this food, um, you have to be concerned about that. Am I right about that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about getting COVID-19 from the food. I am worried about being in a restaurant where there is somebody who is actively shedding the virus and who has symptoms, right? And so if, that, if the person in the back of the house is sick, then that means that the wait staff may be been, have been infected and may be pre-symptomatic and that, that wait staff is bringing out the food to me. I'm worried about being next to people that, that are infected and are not showing symptoms. But you're not so worried. To me, that's, that's the risk in restaurants, not the you're food. You're not worried people. if someone sneezes. I know you don't want to go out and, and publicly just, hear people, but, I just, I, but, but it's something that like I'm getting all these emails from people about that. That's what they want to know. If right. they don't well, know that... that they want to know, can that, just pure science, if you sneeze on it and you ingest it or you touch it and then eat it, can you get the virus? I mean, I think that's what people want to know. We, so we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have any evidence that people can get the virus in that way. But let me also go on record as saying, it's disgusting if someone sneezes on your food and I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think again, it's like the, uh, the answer is yes, 
but but also you don't know. Um, and so it again, this is about a little bit of a risk trade off. So if you know your local pizzeria, the two people working there are operating with really good practices, maybe you want to order from there. If it's the local McDonald's down the street and you're concerned about good hygiene in general, you probably shouldn't. So, you know, you need to use a little bit, I think, of your own thinking. I want to just say that my colleague, Michael Hansen, who I know is listening, just sent me a few updates and um, areas where, I'm sorry, I don't have the most recent information. So I want to share that with all of you, which is that, um, I guess, Don, he wants to share there are ACE2 receptors on the tongue, um, not just lung and colon. So he wants that for me to let you know that. But other things are that on the line speed issue, um, plants can process at 11 poultry slaughter plants. They've been given line speed waivers, which means they can process even more uh, meat, which seems crazy given the infection rates that are happening. And it is true that on the inspection issue, um, now USDA inspects meat, FDA inspects other things, and they're have stopped all but essential inspections um, on FDA in, in the non-meat space on food. So um, that's still, that's an issue, Charles, you know, to your question on our regulations becoming more lax. Um, I, I, again, I think we're looking at what the real cracks in this system actually are, and this is just getting worse, but um, just to share that all with you. I mean, listen, I would just say that COVID can survive on surfaces, whether it's someone sneezing on food or someone who just sneezed in their hand and touched a doorknob and then you touch that doorknob, right? It's the same in some ways. And then you eat a sandwich um, and you didn't wash your hands. So what I want to get back to again is, um, you know, I think preparing food at home right now is probably a good idea. And so to the degree you can do that, I think that's good. If you have a reputable restaurant that you've always gone to, you think they're employing good practices, uh, support them, support those local businesses. But um, I will just say that, you know, do we think that there is no, po I don't think there's no possibility. I like to operate with, there's always a potential possibility. And so to the degree I can maintain the best hygiene I can, that's what I need to do. Um, and, and I'm not sure we can predict everything else. And that's the, that's unfortunately the challenge of this time. Don, you but, to but, but, but yeah, no, and I, and I, I absolutely agree. Right. Um, but, but here's the thing in the meantime, we need to keep eating food, right? And, and everybody needs to make their own best decisions about, about what foods to eat and how to eat, right? And, and, I, and I think this has been, this has been, a, this has been a really good discussion that, that points out that you know, it's, it's, it's actually kind of complicated, um, but, but that's okay, right? We'll, I'll, we'll embrace that complexity and we'll do our best to move forward. Thank you. So, so just some uh, closing, closing and, I, and I did read all the questions and, and thank you all for, for, for them and I tried to incorporate them and honestly, I could go on for another hour and I think just you know, one summary is that as restaurants reopen and even with takeout, um, there's a local takeout place where I am. And by the way, you know, I, I look to see if they're not wearing masks and they're not wearing gloves and taking their gloves off as they serve somebody and, re and redoing their gloves and washing frequently. It's not a kitchen that I could see. I am not interested personally. And as restaurants reopen, you know, um, I'll go out on a leap here as a public health person um, and as a researcher and a public health advocate, um, that if that restaurant, the people aren't wearing masks um, and covering themselves, um, and um, it's not a high quality restaurant, I would be suspect and concerned. Um, that said, you know, I, I, I want to thank you both for, for coming here, especially with both of your incredibly busy schedules. And thank you for this fascinating discussion. I wish we could, you know, stay longer and, and, and get more into it. And I see the questions that are coming in and some frustration still about takeout and this, but I think we've covered a lot of that. Um, uh, that you need to really be clear about the place that you're purchasing from. And, and, and if, you're, if you're afraid to go out, you have any concerns, I probably would order from that takeout place. Um, I'd also like to thank you know, president, the president of Hunter College, Jennifer Rabb, for her support of the Food Policy Center and the City Council. Make sure to check out nycfoodpolicy.org and sign up for our weekly news and research digest. Um, and, and our website, which we have, you know, um, we update with new articles every week. There are two events I'd like to mention quickly. Next Tuesday, May 5th at 9.30, 
the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center as our next event, which is Hunger, Food, and COVID-19 uh, and COVID-19 in New York City. Um, and um, uh, please go to the events tab on nycfoodpolicy.org where you can see that. And then on May 6th at 3 p.m., there'll be another Hunter at Home event called The Dolphin in the Mirror, and Reflections on Dolphin Intelligence Communications. And you can sign up for that at hunter.cuny.edu forward slash hunter uh, dash on dash demand. Thank you so much for your time, you know, uh, Arvashi and Don. It's always an excellent discussion. Um, Charles, stay thank you. I just wanted to quick yeah. say to everybody, um, Grace Communications has a foodprint.org, which has a newsletter. We've been sending out a lot of information around COVID, food, food safety, and have a lot of information there. So please also take advantage of that resource. And John, you have a, a, a podcast, is it? or? Yeah, I've got, I, I just put the, the podcast in uh, link in the chat. It's called Food Safety Talk. That's the name of the podcast. And you can find us at foodsafetytalk.com. We've been talking, we talk a lot about food safety generally. Obviously, it's right in the name of the show, but we've also been specifically talking about COVID-19 in the food industry or the last couple of episodes. And we will, we will continue. Wonderful. And um, again, thank you so much for, for your time. And uh, I appreciate it. And I'll forward some of you, question, you know, the questions that I see, I'll forward uh, to, to to Ravashi and Don and, and, and we'll forward you back an answer. So stay safe and I'll see you all on May 5th at 9.30 a.m. And, and thank you again for everything and stay well. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Charles.